I'm Deborah Duyon. Welcome to Our Town. Our show is dedicated to enhancing citizens' awareness about government. Today, my very special guest is the number one man in Lafayette. Please welcome with me our parish president, Joey Durrell. Thank you, Deb. Glad Hi. to be here. Good to have you back. Well, good to be here. Yeah. Now, you've been in office for five, six months now? I think about five months. About right five months? Today. In fact, I think uh, Saturday might have been our anniversary. Great. Our five-month anniversary. So, how has it been? Was it what you thought it would be, or what? Um, it's been, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's everything I've thought it would be, and, uh, and quite frankly, it's uh, more fun than I expected. Really? Uh, yeah, I love going to work every day and just trying to make Lafayette a better place, so it's, uh, it's a good job. It's a good job. Yeah. Huh? Well, great. Now, you've done, a, you've done a lot in these five months that you've been there. And we're well, really proud of you. We are, uh, well, thank you. It's a... Uh, um, you know, I said for a long time, it's a great community, and it's uh, easy to do good things with a progressive community like Lafayette. So it's uh, that's what makes it so much so enjoyable, I think. Great. Now, before we get into our topic for today, we like to uh, introduce a new show that we're going to be having mm -hmm. here at AOC, and mm -hmm. you're going to be hosting that for the most part. Yep. Yeah. And the title of the show is "It's Your Government." Sure, Kevin. It's uh, you know I said many times uh, that this government is not a private. Um, Party. I mean, I'm sorry. It's not a. Uh, it's not a. Um, what am I trying to say? It's not a uh, <laughs> private club. It's not a private club. It's it's the it's the government for the people of Lafayette Parish, and uh, so what we're going to do is on it's your government. Uh, we're going to have directors from the various departments come on and talk about what they're doing. Uh, we're going to invite area mayors from Lafayette Parish to come on and brag about their community. Oh, wow. um, uh, and we'll ask some of the legislators to come on and talk about what they did in the legislative session and the good things that they've done for the people of Lafayette Parish and, and for the state of Louisiana. And, uh, so, and maybe some other surprise guests from time to time. But the important thing is it's an opportunity for the people who run your government, the people of Lafayette Parish. It's an opportunity for them to come on and talk about what they're doing in their various departments to enhance Lafayette Parish. Oh, wow. Well, you're going to be busy, huh? Yeah, but, you know, I won't, uh, it's not going to always be me that's no. here. No, no, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'm going to try to do a show uh, once, once or twice a month, but um, this show is not about Joey Durrell. This show is about the government for the people of Lafayette Parish. So um, we may have department directors here and some, maybe some of their uh, key employees coming with them, and okay. they'll do their own show, and they'll talk oh. about what they're doing in their, uh, like I said, in their various departments. And when you get to utilize AOC for what it was meant to be. That's right. I mean, this is what AOC is here for. And uh, I have encouraged, um, I've mentioned to the area mayors, uh, but I've encouraged our department directors to get proactive with AOC and make it a communication vehicle. You know, we're right. trying to make this government very open to the people of Lafayette Parish because, as I said, it is not a private club. Right. It is the people's government. And so it's important, I think, for them to get a better understanding of what uh, the good and hard work that the men and women who run this government, what they do. Right. And, uh, you know, we just had some recent floods. I mean, the people in public works right. uh, worked very, very hard in That's spite true. of the fact that there was some uh, some areas that were disappoint, uh, uh, disappointing and, um, you know, some hardships for some people. It's not that the people within government weren't working very hard. Right. And I think uh, it's an opportunity for people who did that kind of work uh, and the heads of those departments to come in and say, this is all we did, and this is why it didn't go quite like we would have liked it to, ideally. Right. Um, so, it's, you know, it's, it's a good opportunity, I think, for the people to hear about their government. Okay, good. I'd like to hear that. Good. Now, for our topic, what we want to talk about today is this fiber optic. Mm -hmm. Exactly. What is it? Why do we want it or even need it? And, right. Um, maybe you could answer some of those hard questions, right. you know. Well, you know, I, I would like to start off by saying, you know, everybody knows that we're looking at possibly bringing television, telephone, and high-speed Internet access to uh, service to Lafayette Parish. Okay. And, of course, the first question that comes to, my, to our minds is we already have that. Right. And right. so it's important for a show like this to explain to people why we're doing that. Okay. What I want to make sure people understand is what makes this unique is this fiber right here. These are the fiber optics. And what people have to understand, I'm not sure if you can get a close-up of this, but I'm going to try to, maybe I'll put it so you can see. Can you get that pretty good? Okay. Each one of these fibers, and I'm going to try to grab one and show you. Okay. And my eyes aren't so good, so I can't. I can feel it, <laughs> but I don't know if you can see that. That one fiber, which is about the thickness of a hair, okay. um, brings enough light, enough data with light, 
to every home in Lafayette, in the city of Lafayette, to provide all the telephone service, all the television service, and all the high-speed internet access service to all of Lafayette Parish. I mean, okay. I'm sorry, to all of Lafayette City, for sure. One? And just one of these fibers. Oh. And we have 96 of these fibers running around Lafayette. Now, the next step in this process is, while we have these fibers running all around Lafayette in the city, we don't have it connected to the home. And oh. there are fibers that private, the private sector has running around the city, but it's not connected to the home. It's called the last mile. It's fiber to the home. They okay. refer to it as FTTH. And the significance is when you have fiber running around the town and then it, it, there's a junction at some point before it gets to your house, far from your house, and from that point on it's coming to your house by copper, copper wire. Okay. Well, that is sort of like putting your thumb over a hose okay. or, or a funnel. You know, it's, it's a bottleneck. Okay. And so that high, high speed is being slowed down. Now... The, the fiber, um, just to give you an example, the television service, the telephone service, we can do for less money because this is it's a less expensive technology once you have it all hooked up. It costs a lot of money to get it to the home. That's where the expense comes in. But to give you an example, our high-speed Internet access will be 10 or even, let's say, 6 to 20 times faster than anything that's available from the private sector right now. Because of that, why? Because this is, understand, this is coming to your home in the form of light. It's not coming to your home via copper wire. Okay. So it's coming in the form of light. So it's much cleaner. It's much more pure. You have, um, you, it doesn't conduct electricity. So you're not going to have the interference you have with the current providers you would have right now. Um, if this rubs up on an electrical line on some pole out there, it's not going to cause, okay. uh, like I said, interference. What's important to the people of Lafayette Parish is that what they're paying $125, $135 for right now, right. Uh, we're going to be able to provide for between $80 and $90, we believe. So immediately, it's Just less saving. money. Right. It's less money. Okay. Additionally, it's higher quality. Okay. So you're getting a higher quality product for less money. That part of it is a slam dunk. That's, right. That part's easy. <laughs> okay. um, and people, uh, we did a survey, as you know, recently, mm -hmm. and uh, we, we, you know, one of the things we learned was that people trust LUS. Mm -hmm. LUS does a tremendous job. What a lot they of people really don't, do. a lot of people don't realize, is that the only reason our cell phones worked for the first three days after Hurricane Lily was because the LUS infrastructure was the only thing working after after Lily. Really? So the reason that um, various companies have cross uh, agreements that if their towers are down, or if they're having a problem with theirs, we can all utilize each other's. Well, right. the only one working in Lafayette was the LUS, LUS. system. So it's a very, um, it's a very high quality system, and um, and people trust it, and it's uh, because it's a, it's such a good system. So you know, this is what it's going to do for the people of Lafayette. But what I think people don't realize, and it may not be as important individually, mm -hmm. but as a community, it sends a tremendous message to the United States that Lafayette is a technologically advanced community. This is something that businesses are thrilled to hear. I mean, there's only two businesses in Lafayette right now that don't like this. Okay. It's not because it's not good. Right. Um, it's because... It's just a little competition. It's a little competition. <laughs> and unfortunately, it... Re and I want to point this out while we're on that aspect of this is the private sector has already told us we will not bring it to Lafayette. Okay. They can't bring it to Lafayette. In the private sector, they need a two, three, at most four-year payoff. Because of how we can potentially finance this by selling revenue bonds, um, you know, government can do this with a 20-year payback okay. uh, by selling bonds. So it's, it's one of those things that I don't think the government or and I, I want to point this out, I want to say our citizen-owned utility, which is what LUS is. LUS right. was set up to run like a business. It was right. run, it was set up right. many, many years ago to compete with the private sector on right. utilities. You know, what people don't realize, well, let me finish this. Um, the private sector has told us we cannot afford to bring this to the people of Lafayette City okay. and Lafayette Parish. So what you have to understand, if the government, if the citizen-owned utility that we call LUS mm -hmm. doesn't provide this to the homes of the people of Lafayette, we will not get it. Other communities around the country will get it, but Lafayette will be left behind. Right. This is a utility, and it is the infrastructure of the 21st century. Okay. Government is expected 
to provide the infrastructure for a community. That's correct. Again, always remember, the private sector has said they will not do it. Lafayette will get left behind. That is the significant issue in this decision that we're making and with the topic of the private sector having to compete with a citizen-owned utility. Mm -hmm. If the private sector said, we'll bring it to the home, it may mean that LUS doesn't do this. No. If we don't do it, if we don't at least look at this, mm -hmm. then I think we have failed in our responsibility to the people of Lafayette. Why right. didn't something like that happen uh, years ago with the with the bridge? Well, okay. um, well, I'll tell you this: is a couple of issues you need to understand. In 1897, LUS brought electricity to Lafayette. Okay. It was almost 35 years later before the private sector brought electricity to Lafayette. It's a very similar situation that we're in today. Okay. Does our citizen-owned utility provide this utility, provide this infrastructure of the 21st century, or do we potentially wait another 30 or 35 years for Lafayette to come into the 21st century? Yeah. That's our choice. Either we look very seriously at doing this, mm -hmm. or we accept the fact that Lafayette's going to be left behind. It's not just about telephone, television, and Internet access. It's about what this can do to attract business and industry from around the country to a community that would be fairly unique. It's already been reported that we'd be the largest community in the country that will have this. Really? In fact, one of the things I like is that we often hear ourselves compared to Texas. We trump Texas with this. you kidding. Because Texas, uh, their legislature has already outlawed this. Municipally owned utilities cannot do they, this. They outlawed it? it will, municipal owned utilities cannot bring this. Okay. As I understand it, Austin, Texas has a ring just like Lafayette does, but they can't utilize it because the private sector has influenced their legislature so much that it's, it, they can't do it. So this is something, again, that will set Lafayette apart. It will be something that will shine a light for all the United States to see that Lafayette, Louisiana is far ahead of the rest of the people when it comes to technological advancement. Now, wasn't this put down for just for this purpose? Well, it was put down because it's, it's a, um, you know, originally they, there was talk about um, this was able to uh, let LUS connect their substations for communications. Okay. This is going to allow not just LUS, but potentially um, other utility companies to take their reader meters or their meter readers, okay. <laughs> uh, their meter readers, and instead of having to send a meter reader to your home, they can train these people to learn more technology, and they'll be able to read your meter from an office. Yes, sir. So even, oh, other, even other utility companies are fairly excited about this possibility because of what they can do without sending people out in cars, mm -hmm. without having to have them get in risk, risking getting bit by a dog. Mm -hmm. I mean, they will be able to read your meter. And the other thing it'll do for so you... So they won't be out of a job. They'll just be a oh, different that's type right. of maybe, job. Maybe a higher-paying job. Yeah. Uh, no, this is not about... This is about creating jobs. This is all about creating jobs. Um, but you'll be able to go on your computer, and maybe it's the 10th of January, mm -hmm. and you'll be able to see what your utility bill is so far for the month, and if things continue on like they are, this is what your bill is projected to be by the end of the month. Yes, sir. Yeah. I mean, this is... This is, this is we're just touching the tip of the iceberg. Wow. Uh, I've heard Terry Huval mention many times that when Lafayette got electricity in 1897, it was simply to change a coal oil lamp to a light bulb. Who thought in 1897 there would ever be anything called a microwave oven? Or look at all the other things we do right. with electricity. Right. What are we going to be able to do in the future with light? Wow. This, this is a unique utility. This is a unique um, technology. And again, the private sector has said Lafayette doesn't get it unless the private, I mean, the citizen-owned utility does it. Does it. So it's, a, um, it's, it's very important for us to at least look at this. We haven't decided for sure that this is going to be done. But another thing I want to point out to you, people have asked me many, many, many times, we've all had this subject come up, why doesn't Lafayette have an interstate quality loop right. around it? Right. Um, all the, you can name all the towns in Louisiana that have it, but right. Lafayette doesn't. Really? I want to explain that little story. Okay. <laughs> I think around 1948, 1949, the federal government was putting together the interstate system. One of the, cri the criteria, or at least one of the main criteria, for them paying for a loop around a city was you had to have 50,000 people. Okay. Lafayette was short by a few thousand people. The leadership at that time started looking at what they could annex to get us up to the 50,000 
okay. population. And they did it. And so they, they, they went to do the annexing, and a privately owned utility company from the private sector okay. fought it. Okay. They took us to court, and we won. We won? And they appealed it. Okay. And we, they appealed it, and we won again. We won every single step of the way. So what happened? <laughs> By the time we finished fighting the battle, okay. the census had been taken, and Lafayette was left behind. Oh, so understand that. The private sector is very nervous about this, mm -hmm. and I don't blame them. You know, right. this is... Um, right, well, they just need to get the information that's to right. understand what's going on. But we can't on. let this opportunity slip through our fingers mm -hmm. without at least giving it a good shot. We have to look at it. Uh, it's important that we, as the leaders of Lafayette Parish, look at what we can do to advance Lafayette. Okay. And so, just like the reason we don't have a loop around Lafayette, because the private sector fought it, and, the way, and their tactic was not to win, uh, the tactic was to win, to but it was through delay tactics. Delay. Delaying, they delayed, they delayed, they delayed, the census was taken, and Lafayette lost its opportunity for a loop. Now we're looking at something today that will cost us in the, I've heard as much as $300 million. Oh gosh. That we could have gotten for free in the 50s. So do we want those same scenarios? Do we want, like electricity, do we want to wait 30 or 35 years for the private sector to bring this to us? Like a loop, do we, are we willing to let this opportunity slip through our fingers because of a principle that I feel is sort of shaky at this time? And that principle being, does government, does this citizen-owned utility compete with the private sector? My answer is, government should not compete with the private sector unless there is a public need, mm -hmm. and I think the public need here is that we need to do everything we can to move Lafayette Parish forward. If we don't do this, the private sector will not do it for probably many, many, many years to come. Right. Do we let this opportunity slip through our fingers, or do we move forward? So we could get uh, blocked like they did in, in Austin also, right? That's right. Well, we'd, I think, um, we, you know, with the help of Kathleen Blanco, uh, I would say she was uh, very strong in this legislative session. It's not, the battle's not over yet. Uh, they have tried to get it outlawed. They've tried to prevent municipalities from the state uh, from moving forward. Um, understand something. This is something that's going to cost about $100 million to get to every home in the city of Lafayette. Okay. The private sector can go to an Atlanta, and for the same number of people with all the high-rises, um, they can do a few blocks <laughs> for maybe... $10 million, maybe $5 million, and get as much money in return as we would take all of Lafayette to return. That's why they won't do it. There's too many uh, oh, very too densely cool. populated right. communities that they can invest less money and make more money, mm -hmm. and therefore they can get their return in a two or three or four year period. Only, the only reason an LUS can do this is because we can, ex we, because it is a, pr a citizen-owned utility, we can extend our payback over a course of many, many more years. Right. We have the time. To That's right. Yeah. So understand, the private sector will not bring this to Lafayette. If we don't do it, it's not going to happen. happen. You're right. Now, what are all the, uh, you said one of those, one of those wires right. will be able to service all of Lafayette, right? Right. What what are the rest of them for? Well, it's <laughs> for expansion. I mean, you know, we're going to have companies. We're going to have companies. Things? We're going to have companies coming in okay. um, that you know that are going to be looking at this. I mean, I've already talked to a couple of companies just here in Lafayette that can't wait for this possibility wow. because they said it will make it'll it'll bring their technology to a level where th the bounds would be unlimited. Um, you know, this has been called a future-proof technology. Um, you know, and I think future proof, you're talking maybe the next 30, 40, 50 years. Mm -hmm. uh, who knows what, what will happen in the future that will be faster than light. We just <laughs> okay. can't think of it right now. <laughs> I can't but, imagine. You know, the, the exciting thing for me is what is light going to bring to our home yeah. in five or ten years from now? It's already been said that the Internet, the email that you and I use every day right. will be obsolete in five years. You serious? Yeah. And, you know, and this is Star Wars kind of, kind of stuff, but what about a mother who's got a child across the state, across the country, maybe across the ocean? Uh -huh. And right now they can email to each other. They can even put a little um, camera on their computer and talk to each other. Right. Uh, this will, by the way, make that real time. 
It's not going to be jerky. No and delay. It won't be all that jerky kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. It'll be just like as if we're talking. Mm -hmm. But what? who knows in five or ten years from now if a mother can be talking to her son, kind of like we're talking right now, where there's at least an, a, a, a 3D-looking image of okay. him right there. Wow. You know, I mean, who knows? I mean, that, you know, it's kind of silly in a way, but <laughs> that's only because we can't comprehend what the future holds. As I said, in 1897, who would have ever thought of something like a microwave oven? Right. You know, or cameras, okay. you know, I mean, you know, it just wasn't something right. um, that was there. I mean, uh, so this is this is this is exciting stuff to me because of what it will do for economic development. We talk a lot about getting our kids back home. Right. We talk a lot about creating jobs. Right. Um, you know, I ran a lot in my campaign. We talked a lot. I heard about getting out of the box. Right. And what I have learned is for a lot of people. Getting out of the box can be a little uncomfortable, mm -hmm. but I think it's incumbent upon us, the leaders of Lafayette, to get out of the box, at least to look out of the box. Yeah. And while we haven't decided for sure that this is going to happen, I think we would be failing the people if we didn't look at every opportunity we have to try to make this happen. Okay. Now, how is this um, going to affect, I know they had said that each home will be provided with a uh, computer. How? How? That's, a, you know, that's kind of hard for people to fathom right now. But, it's exactly but there's a model already. Work. There's a model already. And yeah. what Deborah's talking about is the, uh, us solving what is referred to as the digital divide. Okay. The issue there is the people that can afford what they refer to as the haves and the have-nots. The mm -hmm. people who can afford a computer and those that cannot afford a computer. Uh, you know, when it comes to education, this is a tremendous opportunity. Mm -hmm. But solving the digital divide, the the the, the Thinking is the possibility, just like when people go to get a cell phone, which is common today, right. they go get a cell phone, and the company says, we will give you this cell phone for free if you <laughs> sign a two-year contract. Yeah. Because That's, we know nothing's free, really. Well, but, but, huh. th but basically, it, 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 it's not free, but you're not having to spend the $200 for the phone. Right. Well, and okay. so, up front. So, basically, what they're doing is they're kind of financing the phone with the profits that they're going to get from your usage every month. Okay. So you get this $200 phone for free, you have a 40 or 50 or $100 monthly bill, well, that little bit of money every month that they're getting, um, that the phone cost them is being made up for by the user fees, by okay. what, you're, what you're paying your bill every month. Okay. So the thinking with us is, and this is still in the dreaming stages, okay. but I think it's an exciting possibility, and that is we tell people... And I want to point out something. They don't have to take all three services if we do this. No? Oh, no, no, no. This, <laughs> and they will still have the private sector to go to. You if know, it's not like, yeah, okay. this is just an, another choice for the people of Lafayette. It is competition. And if they choose to stay with the private sector company, it's okay. It'll be there. If they want to take just our television service, they can do that, and they can take the private sector's telephone service. If, but what, we'll, what we're looking at possibly doing from a marketing standpoint and something that will help the community mm -hmm. is what if we tell you that, Ms. Duyon, if you take all three of our services, we will give you potentially this computer for free. Oh, okay. And the bill you pay us every month will, over the course of three years, let's say, if you, let's say we would ask you to take all three services, or if you took all three services and signed a three-year contract, uh -huh. we, were able to, we were able to give you access to the Internet. So now not only will you have access to the Internet, your children will have access to the Internet. And, you know, as we know, many of our children go to school right. and get to use computers right. and come home and don't either, either don't have it available. Right. And, uh, and especially the parents who aren't going to school every day don't understand the Internet. I mean, I've got friends who still don't use it, yeah. and I don't. I can't imagine getting by every day without doing <laughs> know. email. You know, so now the children will go home, have the computer at home, and teach the parents how to use the computer. Wow. And I think there's more issues there. I mean, you know, we need to t work with the school system okay. uh, to educate people on the computers. We, maybe maybe we'll even provide a little class to show people how to use that computer. And as to how, you know, you can. What if we go out and we want to buy ten or fifteen? thousand computers at a time. We think we can get a second or third generation computer, maybe not the most up-to-date model, mm. but we'll be able to provide people with a computer that will give them access to the internet. Right. And so I, and some we could people be, could even have two in their home. That's know? right. And that would make Lafayette, Louisiana, the first city in the United States of America to solve the digital divide. And I think that would shine a light, a successful light on a community in a state that needs a success.
and it would be a success that sends a message to the rest of the country that Lafayette, Louisiana is a technologically advanced community. Wow. And I think that's a good message to send. Well, you know, that's one of the first messages I got when I came to Lafayette, that it was a city on the move. And it's still moving. We're a progressive community. We're very entrepreneurial. Right. And I think that's how people of Lafayette, I'm hoping, will embrace this potential technology. Great. Well, thank you for coming out today. Well, thank you. And we look forward to seeing you on, your, on the show, not all the time. No, but, but I'll be here. And what's the name of it again? It's Your Government. It's Your Government. It's right. Your Government. All right. right. Thanks again, Joe. Thank you, Deborah. I'm Deborah Duyon, and thank you for watching Our Town. You gotta make this one. <laughs> oh, I'm all pinned and poked. Okay, right, so I'm just. Deborah Duyon, welcome to Our Town. Our show is dedicated to enhancing citizens' awareness about government. Today, from the from Traffic and Transportation Department, please welcome with me the Transportation Service Services Coordinator, Janella Baptiste. Hi, Janella. Hi, Debbie. Good to see you. You too. Yeah, it's been a while though. Huh? Has been. Good. Good. Well, I'm glad you were able to take off today a little bit to. Uh, Inform the public of all the services that you do for us. Well, thank you for having me here. You know, uh, your uh, supervisor, Tony Tramble, he speaks very, very highly of you. Well, thank you. That's good and to know. he was like, get Janella on the <laughs> show. <laughs> and we're glad you came out today. Glad to be here. Yeah. So, this, before we get into all the services mm -hmm. that you do for the city, tell us a little bit about you. I've been working for... City of Lafayette, which is now Lafayette Consolidated Government, for 24 years and three months. Um, oh, well, I started you in get as that a, three months in there. I did that three months. <laughs> I started off basically as a clerk, uh -huh. clerk one, uh -huh. and I worked myself up to a clerk three, which was a promotion. 
um, after that, I did that for a couple of years, and I was promoted to signs and markings for mine. And when Tony Trimble came over, I reorganized the uh, department, and I became traffic services coordinator, which is basically supervisor of all the traffic signs and the pavement markings that you see on the roadway. Right. Um, I supervise approximately 11 employees. I have a great group, you know. Yeah. Um, I have two kids. I have a son that's 26. He's an LPN. I have a daughter that's um, 17. She's going to be a senior this coming year. Great. So. Well, the way that you run that sign department, <laughs> you know, that, that is awesome. I've seen yeah. you in action. You are just like Tony, huh? <laughs> well, we try to be, you know, we try to be the best we could be. And that's true. And, uh, and it's really good for the public to right. do this. And I, you know, I throw it out a lot that the employees always try to do the best. And mm -hmm. they could tell you one of the favorite things is document. Document everything document. we do. Um, but basically, I have a good group. We enjoy what we do. Of course, at times, I get a look at kick butt. Right. That's when we get going, you know. Yeah, when the going so, gets done. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. But uh, today we're going to talk about the traffic signs. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now, they're very important because a lot of people don't realize, and, and a lot of them don't realize how large these signs are. That's correct. You know? We have approximately 41,000 signs that the city and parish has to gather. Um, that's not counting the sign that's on a state roadway because okay. we don't maintain a state roadway. Okay. But approximately 15,000 signs are in the parish, and the rest are in the city. Um, Traffic signs are basically separated by categories. Okay. Uh, we have three categories that we refer to signs as. We have what we call regulatory signs, and most of those are black and white in color. Example, your speed limit. Okay. okay? Uh, right. Your one-way signs. We call those regulatory, you know, parking signs. Then we have uh, warning signs, which are your yellow and black. Mm -hmm. A warning to people of a potential hazard or just something that's coming up that they need to be aware about. Then we have the guide signs. And underneath guide signs is your street name signs, your um, signs that to direct the public where they need to be, your camping signs, just basic guide signs. Okay. Uh, the most popular out of the signs are your street name signs. Oh, okay. okay. Now, what, what is so uh, particular about the street name? Are there, is, they have to be a certain height? Uh, well. <clears throat> well, all of the signs have to be a certain height. Okay. We have certain criteria to use, Debbie. Um, we all certified in what we do. Let me back up a little bit. Okay. All of us in the department is certified, with the exception of the clerk typist, mm -hmm. as um, level three signs and markings certification. And we went to school, got certified. Level three is the highest. When we deal with traffic signs, it's not we just don't go up there and, and put up a sign. We have certain criteria. They have to be so many feet away from the face of the curb, okay. so you know, so tall, and it's certain stuff we need to work with. Now that's all. That's on even the street name signs. Even on the street name signs, okay. it's every traffic sign that we put up. And the reason I say traffic signs is because we have a lot of signs out there that's basically uh, privately owned. We don't consider those a traffic sign. A traffic sign is for the motorists. It's going to tell you what to do or what's going on on the roadway. Okay. Okay. Okay, now uh, we have an example of that street name sign. We have a street name sign that um, I brought here today. The street name signs are our most popular sign for being stolen. <laughs> okay, we have to go to people signs? steal these. <laughs> and we think it's because of the words, the layout. Basically, if it's a name of a person, if we have a street that's named uh, Debbie Circle, okay. we find that those are being taken more than just a plain uh, Johnson Street. Okay. Um, this sign here in particular is one of the hottest that's missing. You know, we get a bunch of those that's missing. And the, the hard part about this sign is fabricated by hand. We actually have to make these by hand. So it takes us a little while to do it. But this is, you know, it's considered a street name. It tells you where you're going, which street you're looking for. And also has the uh, block number. It tells you the block number here, and we also put the suffix, if it's a boulevard, if it's a street, if it's an avenue, okay. and so on. Now, you said these had to be made by hand. So each one of these letters are put on individually? <clears throat> okay, what we do is we have this computer. We have a computer machine. And what we do, we type in the street name. Okay. We have this sheeting that's placed on this sign. Once this is cut off, we take it off, we weed it, 
covered with application tape, and we come in and we kind of like squeegee it on the side. Okay, but they're made by hand. It's not a process where we could screen. We also do some screening, you know, mm-hmm. where we screen signs. And uh, street name signs, like I said, is, is one of the popular ones. We had the street that was called Street of Love. Oh, you okay. <laughs> oh, remember that? <laughs> we had to replace that sign just about every month. Really? Okay. Well, you know, when I first started with the city, they had this uh, gentleman that had called in a complaint. And I asked him what street uh, did, did he live on. And he said he lived on Street of Love. I'm like, yeah, I'm sure, <laughs> you know, until I actually went to the map and found out there was exactly a mm-hmm. street called Street of Love, you yes. know, in Honeymoon Subdivision. <laughs> I don't know about the subdivision, <laughs> but uh, they abandoned that roadway somewhat, so yeah. we've been having, you know, we don't have the headache that we had before with it. Okay. But this is one of the most popular sites. And the strange part about it is we, hear, we get calls coming in the office that we have it signed down. Okay. And we have to screen the calls. You know, most people just think a sign is a sign. Mm-hmm. But, for instance, your stop signs, okay. that's our priority. Okay. If we get a call and you have a stop sign down on this corner, we react. Within 30 minutes, we have a crew out there taking care of that stop sign. Really? Whereas if it's a street name, we'll have a crew out there if it's a potential hazard. Okay. And what I mean by that is if we get a call and say so you have a sign down, then we screen them. Well, what type of sign is it? Uh, they think every sign is a street sign or okay. a traffic sign. Okay. There are particular names. If you could tell us a speed limit, if you could tell us it's a warning sign or a street name, okay. then we know how to react. Okay. Um, if it's down, then we ask them a little further. Do we have a broken post? Is okay. it leaning over the sidewalk? Right. You know, is any potential a- hazard that it may be, because that's the first ones we want to respond to. Okay. So well, if it's dangling from the it's, from the street, you it, might want to oh, get out there and handle up on it. Oh, yeah, we need to go and take care of it. We <laughs> surely don't want it to fall on nobody's head. <laughs> you know, so that would help us, you know, if the public would call in and just let us know uh-huh. exactly what kind of sign it is and if it's a hazard. Okay. Okay. Getting a little glare here. Oh. Okay. <laughs> okay, now the other signs. Um, okay. The uh, stop signs. Now they have to be in certain positions and mm-hmm. so far from the road. What, what are some That's of the criteria? That's correct. Criterias? Okay, some of the criteria for all of the traffic signs is you have to have them seven feet tall in the urban area, which is your city area. Um, you want them high enough so that a pedestrian won't pass underneath and, and hurt themselves. So we go seven feet high. They have to be two feet away from the face of the curb, you know, sideways away from the street. Uh, we could go at one foot minimum, but we try not to practice that. Okay. So you want it clear on that corner. So if you have pedestrians, if you have large trucks turning that corner, they won't, you know, mess up the signs or the signs won't be in way of their path. Okay. So we, we use certain criteria. Okay. Now what about, I've seen uh, in some of the streets where the stop sign is very, very far from the corner. What, what are the uh, people supposed to do? How, <laughs> and okay. why is that? We have... Maybe only two locations that I could remember in Lafayette where we had to put the stop sign 50 feet away from the intersection. 50? 50 feet is the max amount that we could put up any, well, primarily the stop sign from okay. a corner. Um, we don't make up the rules. We follow the rules and the guidelines from the Federal Highway Administration. And the lead on that is if you cannot post a stop sign at the corner where it needs to be, then you have 50 feet to drop it back. However, in the event that we do that, we have to make sure we have a stop bar, which is a form of a pavement marking, at the point of where the vehicle needs to stop. So you might find that the stop sign is 50 feet from that corner, Mm -hmm. but that stop bar is at that corner, and that's telling you where you need to be. Okay, so the public needs to know that they have to stop. Then they need to stop at the stop bar. Um, If we have a location that's marked with a stop bar and a crosswalk, Mm -hmm. Don't encroach into the crosswalk. You need to stop at the stop bar. Okay, so a lot of people don't know that they have to stop no. this far, just looking at that pavement marking, right? Right, right. They get, you know, they're really not sure where the stopping point, but the stop bar is normally where the front end of the car should be. That's, you know, the judgment that we use. Okay. But they need to stop there, especially if that stop sign is 50 feet away from that corner. Okay. Now, let's go back to the street signs before we go into the paving. Okay, you have 
we went over the street names mm -hmm. and the, uh, what are the warning signs? Okay, we have a variety of warning signs. Those are the black and yellow signs. Um, we have warning signs that'll tell you if you're about to approach a turn. Okay, you, it's going to be a 90 degree sign with an arrow, turn arrow. Mm -hmm. We have what we call chevron signs with just a basic arrow nose, we call it. Um, okay. We have one of the most popular is our object markers. Those are the uh, black and yellow signs. It's the yellow black ground with the little uh, stripes on them coming down at a 45 degree slope. Okay. And what we do there is we put it at potential hazards, primarily your bridges, okay. your culverts. Um, we mark it at that corner of the bridge of the culvert so that you'll know you want to stay away from that. It's to keep away from this corner, this edge of the roadway. Okay. Stay away from it. Try to close in into your roadway because it's some type of potential hazard on that corner. We don't want a you know, vehicle running into it. Okay. Um, we have arrow boards. We have reverse turns. We have speed advisory plates. If you're approaching a turn, you might see a little plane underneath it that's, say, 30 mile per hour. Yeah. We're telling you that's the safest speed to make that turn, so you need to slow down if you're not doing so. So we have a variety of warning signs. Okay, and the uh, sign that you used to have out there, uh, when I was there, they used to call them delineators. Okay. <laughs> Y'all have upgraded this well, now. What, what long ago, <laughs> long ago. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, delineators, those were the black and white signs. Right, they were the yeah, white right. signs with the black stripes at a 45 degree angle. The object markers took the place of the delineators. Oh, okay. okay, Federal Highway Administration upgraded that type of signs. So we no longer use delineators, the black and white signs. We use the object markers. You know, and people today still call in and say, you have a delineator down. So. You know, you're, not the, you're not the only one. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, they've been up. They've been changed to okay. object markers. Okay. Yeah. Have you checked out the new school signs? The fluorescent yellow. Yes, I saw that they're they're kind of greenish looking. Now. It's a wow, fluorescent wow. yellow green. Why is that? Because they used to be the uh, uh, the yellow. Right. They used black. to be the yellow and black. And again, uh, the Federal Highway Administration upgraded, approved it. And I'm proud to say that Lafayette was one of the first that went in with the pilot program. So we got all, all right. our school signs up to get, you know, <laughs> upgraded. Within, uh -huh. within six months, we had that work done. All the school and pedestrian signs you'll see are now the fluorescent yellow-green, beautiful mm -hmm. color. And it really grabs attention. It really does. When we first went in with the signs, we got oh, numerous calls saying, you know, the signs look good. It was a good thing. Now oh. we could see it. It catches our, you know, attention. Great. And uh, uh, my next goal is to bring in the fluorescent yellow-green pavement marking. You know, the crosswalks that's normally marked in the white, yeah. we could mark it in that fluorescent yellow-green. I haven't purchased it yet. You know, I have to find out in you know, the finances first, but yeah. I plan on doing that, put down a few and left yet. So the signs are basically out there for people to understand. It gives them an insight of what's going on, what's coming, you know, it provides them knowledge, Everything, you know, yeah. knowledge as to what's going on in the roadway. Now, do you get a, a what is the procedure, say, like if there's someone that's deaf and they, how do y'all, do y'all handle that? I've seen some, and then very few, mm -hmm. uh, deaf area or something. Yeah, we have a few uh, signs out there that says deaf or blind, or blind you know. Right area we have deaf and blind crossing mm -hmm. uh, the deaf and blind crossing we see a lot of on St. Mary around right. the school area right but say it's just a residential neighborhood okay. and you have a kid that's deaf what the parents need to do is contact our traffic engineering office and request that a sign be installed certain procedures need to be followed because we need their medical you know rod cuts and just certain criteria mm -hmm. once uh, all that's evaluated then they go ahead and send me the job order on it and we get it done. Great. But those signs are only up for a certain amount of years. And I think right now it's 18 years old. Once the kid makes 18, then we need to go in and take down the sign. Okay. Okay. So you have that all logged in and you yes. know when to send them. I know you do. <laughs> yeah, I have this great tickler file system, you know, and I just put it in there and hope that I'll be there yeah. in 18 years to take it out and, and get it down. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, now I've noticed on the back of um, especially your, your stop signs mm -hmm. that there's dates on them and they have mm -hmm. these other little numbers. What is what does that signify? The date on the back of any sign is the sign, is the, excuse me, the date that we installed the sign. It's the sign installation date. 
Then you'll see a six or eight digit number mm -hmm. behind that sign. That's our inventory. We have a traffic sign inventory system, Debbie. And um, again, we were one of the first to have it. What we do is when we install a sign, we insert all this data into the computer. Okay. You know, telling us where the signs installed, the direction, uh, the type of posts, the sign size, and all this good information. Suppose you're riding around town and you see a sign down. Uh -huh. And you call me and you say, Janola, you have a sign down. Here's the sign number, 940016. <laughs> you really think I was smart, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I'll go in and we'll key it in the computer and it'll tell me exactly where that sign goes. It'll tell me if it goes on location where you've seen it or if somebody picked it up and just brought it at that spot. But it'll tell us where we, we need to go back up with that sign. Wow. Yeah. So y'all you have got everything down to a science over there. That's huh? right. We try. We try. We <laughs> try to be. <laughs> That's yeah. great. Okay, now let's move on into the, the pavement markings. Okay. How important are they? Very important. Pavement markings are, are they're very important. Uh, you need to mark the roadway so that the motorists will know which direction, which lane they need to be in. Mm -hmm. um, basically, we have two colors that we work with. Your yellow, which mm -hmm. is marking of your center lines. If you're driving down a roadway and you see a two yellow, li uh, two yellow lines, mm -hmm. it's a double yellow double we refer yellow. to. That means you cannot cross over that center right. line. Then we have the white skips. Uh, for people traveling the same direction. You know, it's okay when you see the broken lines as we refer to them, right. it's okay you for you cross. to pass the right. vehicle, you could cross right. it. But once you see a solid, then you don't want to cross that. Um, and is that a, there's a reason because it's either not safe? That's correct. It's not safe. Uh, you're coming into a curve. You're into what we call a no passing site where you can't see what's coming on, you know, the opposite direction of you. Right. Uh, those pavement markings, it takes a lot of brain work. I mean, when you're out there on a roadway and you have this, this road to stripe, mm -hmm. you have to get out there and you have to, to plot certain points. You have to find the center line mm -hmm. of that roadway. You have to know how wide the stripe's supposed to go. See, we use all, all those are certain measurements. We can't just go and say, well, so I'm going to put down well, a this line. This looks like the center line. and this is No, it's measurements. You, you have, have to, to get out there and physically, physically measure, measure and plot everything. your points and then you, you lay out your roadway. And I'm sure some of you have seen on the local roadways, when we go and we prepare to mark a road, we do a layout. And you'll see paint markings all over the road right. until the, you know, the material come down. Uh, those markings has to be certain width, certain spacing. You know, so it's not that we just go in there and say, "I'm gonna just paint this yellow." You can't do that. You have to really? measure the distance between those two yellow lines has to be a certain measurements. And that's um, re that's required. By that's the required state. by the Federal Highway Administration. Federal. Okay. Right. Um, your skips, your broken lines has to be so many feet apart from each other. They have to be so many feet long. So, yeah, we, you know, it, it's a lot of work. So you're just not haphazardly putting out there, well, oh, this not. looks like a good spot to put this line. No, Because no. I've seen people going this way. Not at all. No. We have, no way. We have to measure that roadway. We have to look at, you know, good, you have to use good uh, engineering judgment when you're out there. Sometimes we'll get plans to market. Once we get out there in the field, we can't market it according to the plans that we have. So we have to, you know, just fit it in. Okay. You know, we have to cut down on, on some of the measurements or just make it fit. Mm -hmm. And we enjoy it. It's, it's a brainstorm. It's very challenging. The pavement markings is very challenging. And I, I really enjoy it. So now there's, there's uh, maybe, what, two types that you put, you put down there? Mm -hmm. Some of them. So you don't really paint anymore. No, we use what we call thermoplastic markings. Um, <clears throat> It's a block of material, and we have this pre melters this heaters, as you want to refer to them, that melts down this material. So when those guys is out there, it's out there on the pavement, mm -hmm. asphalt, concrete, we're working on a, a surface that's about 100 degree, oh especially goodness. when it's hot out there, and you, yeah. you're pushing a machine that's 450 degrees in temperature, so it's hot, but you're putting down this hot material. Mm -hmm. um, besides the thermoplastic, we use a minimum amount of tape, preformed tape. And what it is, is this roll that comes already rolled up, you know, the material's already rolling. You cut the length of what mm -hmm. you need, and you have to put down a, uh, like a glue, a primer on, on the pavement and apply it. But we basically use a thermoplastic, more of that than the tape. And that, that actually lasts longer than Definitely. We found that thermoplastic, 
lasts at least eight years, depending on the area. Ambassador Caffrey, I'm not going to get eight years. A lot of traffic. <laughs> but most of the other roadways, you know, we're going to get that. Uh, whereas the preformed tape, we were only getting like four or five years. The reflectivity, you know, just wasn't gone. The tape was wearing out. Um, we don't use any paint. The only paint that you'll find us working with is if we curb painting or we painting parking lots. But on the city or parish roadways, we don't use any paint. Okay, now what, a, what would actually happen if they, you get out there, you actually put down the, what do you call it, perma? Thermoplastic? Thermoplastic. 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 Okay. okay. And then they decide to widen the road. That changes the whole scheme of things, right? Right. Can you get it off? How do you get that? Yeah, we can get it off. <laughs> uh, we have what we call removers, okay. line line removers. Okay. And these are little machines that we put on that line that we need to take up, and we grind it off. You know, it's a grinding. It peels really? it off, more or less, eats yeah. it off. Um, we take it off. Lots of time we have problem with the image is still, you know, yeah. the imprint is still on there. And like sometimes, right, it, you all it leaves an image. Yeah. <laughs> and when we apply the new markings, sometimes it could be a little confusing. But what we do is we come back and we correct that in one way or the other. If it means we need to repaint over the line that we remove with okay. black paint or with concrete color looking paint, we okay. do what we have to do to get it right for the mortars. <laughs> okay. Okay. So they can actually... Okay, it was here, but it's not here anymore, so this is what this you is need it. to follow. You need to follow this one, this nice, pretty one. This is the one you need to follow. Okay. You know? yeah. Now, before we run out of time, okay. how much uh, vandalism do you have to your sign? You know, do they, I, people used to shoot up the signs. <laughs> we find that, yeah. Uh, when we first first consolidated, we had a lot of that in the parish. Where we get out on a road and, oh, man, every one of the signs had bullet holes. Like a, you know, they go out there and practice target shooting. Uh, vandalism has dropped somewhat. We find a whole lot of more stealing of the signs because these are aluminum, Debbie, and so maybe that's why people are taking it. They think they, they could go and sell them. You know, the signs are aluminum. Yeah. I don't know, but... Uh, Especially if they have their name on it. Uh. Right. <laughs> uh, but vandalism has dropped somewhat, but yeah, we had a problem with signs. They would shoot them up. If not, spray paint. Okay. Speed limits, they love them. If we have 30 mile per hour, they'll go there with black paint and make it 80 mile an hour. They get calls, well, why do you have 80 mile per hour posted on this road? We have no idea, but thank you for calling us. We're going to go take care of it. Okay. So we have, you know, some vandalism. So we still have a little more educating to do to the people out there. Yes, okay. yes, we sure do. Uh, but that's it's a lot for them. We, the only thing we ask is that if they call the office to report a sign down, if they could please tell us what type of sign it is. Okay. And, you know, anything that would help us. Do we have a broken post? Okay. Is it leaning in the traffic? Is right. it leaning over the sidewalk? And that would really help us. Well, great. You know. And you have really helped us with all this information. Well, thank you. I enjoyed it. Thanks for coming. It wasn't that painful. No, it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again. I'm Deborah Duyon, and thank you for watching Our Town. Thank <laughs> you.